Check it out now, y'all. Nano Hub U Online Instruction. Hello and welcome back to the Nano Hub U course, Thermal Energy at the Nanoscale. I'm Tim Fisher from Purdue and we're in the middle of week two. Today's topic is acoustic phonons and particularly their specific heat. Just to remind you, specific heat is the derivative of the specific internal energy with respect to temperature. And then we, the, the phenomenological version of that is that it's the amount of energy required to raise an object's temperature by one degree. And we went to some trouble last time to express that in terms of an integral. And what we find is that when we take that temperature derivative, the only thing that's temperature dependent is the distribution function. And today we're going to talk about phonons, and that distribution function is a little bit simpler for phonons than it is for electrons because there's no number constraint on phonons, and therefore the chemical potential, mu, in this equation is zero. And so we, we're left with just the energy um, of a phonon, which is h bar omega, and then we'll, we will convert in some cases to frequency space instead of energy space or k space as we do these, these integrals. Now there's a, a model that's very, very common for acoustic phonons, and the, the model is called the Debye model. And what we do is we approximate the dispersion relation that we derived before, for example, for a one-dimensional chain, it's a quarter sine wave for those acoustic phonons. We approximate that as linear. And just to give you a, a little bit of a good feeling about that, uh, a sine wave near the origin, so near a zero argument, is, is, near, is linear, or nearly so. Um, and as you move away, so as we move away from the center of the Brillouin zone, we expect that this approximation might break down. Another way of saying that is that the, uh, the approximation should be especially good for lower temperatures, again, for phonons near the, the middle of the Brillouin zone, lower frequency, uh, longer wavelength, and so forth. And in fact, it's not bad for the upper end of temperature either because of some of the accounting that we're going to do that we'll talk about. Now I want to remind you a little bit about the uh, some of the things that we've done before in terms of density of states. This is a re-derivation of what we had done last week when we were talking about the statistics of carriers. So if we're interested to know the number of modes, capital N, these are phonons, uh, inside of k-space, what we'll do, at least as an approximation, is say that this k-space we'll think of as a sphere in three dimensions. And we know that each mode occupies a space of 2 pi over L around it, so that's 2 pi over L all cubed in K space. That's the term here. And so we can express the number of modes in terms of the size of the K space. This is going to be particularly important when we start to restrict the wave vector in this Debye approximation, because that's something we're going to need to do. When we go through this, we can this analysis of the number of modes relative to the wave vector k, uh, that will give us a relation for the density of states. And that's shown down here. We had used the chain rule to derive this last time. Uh, but now there's a little bit of difference because we can say that the derivative of frequency with respect to wave vector is just the group velocity. And once we've done that, we can plug it into our expression for density of states and we can find a density of states that depends only on frequency and this average velocity that um, also deserves quite a bit of analysis and scrutiny. Um, it, it, can, it can change depending on some of the approximations that we make, but for now let's just think of that as a reasonable approximation for the group velocity. And in some cases you'll be averaging over different branches or polarizations. Um, you'll be averaging even over uh, acoustic and optical phonons, but it's, it's an average that has some basis um, in the physics of the problem. And speaking of polarizations, uh, these phonon polarizations, we've only said a little bit about them. Um, we talked about acoustic and optical branches. Um, here I want to describe to you a, a multi-dimensional system where we can have longitudinal and transverse polarizations of the waves that are going through the material. So let's say in both cases the wave is propagating from left to right on your screen. A longitudinal wave actually uh, has the displacements of the atoms 
in the same direction, plus or minus, as the wave is propagating. In general, because you're sort of vibrating against a, a nearest neighbor, uh, in this case, these waves tend to have a higher effective spring constant, which uh, means that they'll also go faster for a given mass. Uh, and so those will tend to be the faster waves that are moving through materials. In contrast, the transverse waves, those are shown at the bottom of the screen, the displacement of transverse waves is orthogonal to the direction of wave propagation. So they're moving side to side, but the wave itself is moving uh, in, in the orthogonal direction, in this case, left to right. And these waves tend to have a somewhat lower spring constant, therefore they're a little bit slower than the longitudinal waves. And they also often have what we call a twofold degeneracy because they can oscillate um, in, in two orthogonal directions to the wave direction. So that's also important to note. Sometimes we'll be working on three-dimensional problems and you'll only see two polarizations of the phonons that would be longitudinal and transverse, but the transverse actually has two degenerate uh, dispersions inside of it. So just, just keep that in mind as, as we go through. Now, as we, as we implement this Debye model, what we'd like to do is to substitute the Debye dispersion model into the expression for specific heat that we, that we started with. And um, one, of the th one of the factors that's very important, and we talked about earlier in the course, is that the wave vector cannot increase indefinitely because we have finite lattice spacing and so the case space sort of repeats itself and in general we're sticking to uh, you know, well we we have all the information we need about a lattice and the the wave uh, nature in the first brillouin zone but uh, the Debye approximation does not have that same periodicity and so we said it was linear and so it could conceivably go on forever and w probably the most profound approximation within the the Dubai model is that we is that a cap a maximum wave vector was defined and this wave vector was defined defined very quantitatively namely that it has to you you pick the the maximum wave vector so that you have the right number of modes of phonon modes and so we know what the right number of phonon modes is it turns out that the number of allowable modes for a given polarization and branch uh, is the same as the number of unit cells uh, in, and so we can take that that sort of matching of the two concepts in real space and in in reciprocal space and define what the maximum wave vector is and that's going to be the upper limit on some of these integrals that we talked about so if you go back a couple of slides and look at the number of modes related to K, you'll see that we, we were in, in K space, when we took the sphere in K space, that was a 4 thirds pi K cubed. And we were dividing that by 2 pi over L, all cubed. So that, if we take the 4 thirds pi, divide it by an 8 pi cubed, we end up when we combine things and shift things around with a maximum wave vector to fit all of the modes in of 6 pi squared times eta sub a. So that's the number of unit cells per unit volume. So that's just n divided by uh, L cubed, uh, all to the one third power. So that defines our Debye wave vector. And that's very important. And you can see that it really comes from a very simple geometric consideration. The number of unit cells per unit volume is something that, that we can calculate very simply by knowing the lattice structure. And in fact, if we also know the number of, of atoms per unit cell, then it's very easy to calculate this as well, knowing the, the atomic masses and the density. So this is what the dispersion approximation looks like. This is the Debye approximation, what it would look like in k-space. Of course, this is a one-dimensional k-space, so we'd kind of rotate this around for two and three dimensions. Um, the actual dispersion is on the top. And for now, we're going to ignore the optical phonons. The next lecture will cover optical phonons. But I will say here that sometimes the optical phonons are clubbed together with the acoustic phonons in the Debye approximation. So you have to be very careful about what assumptions are being made when, when you're using the, uh, the Debye approximation. How many of these branches are you actually including? But we take those quarter sine waves in the, for the acoustic branches and we approximate those as linear. 
and uh, we, we go all the way out to the cutoff wave vector, which in general is going to be outside, slightly outside the edge of the, of the Brillouin zone. That's just how the math adds up, the number counting adds up, and it, it can go nearer or farther to the edge of the Brillouin zone depending on how many branches you've included in the approximation. So again, it gets often it gets back to the, uh, to, to the approximations that you're making. How many of these branches are you actually using for your approximation? So we have the Debye wave vector defined, and you'll actually rarely hear it used. In fact, most, most of the time, the cutoff frequency, omega sub d, is used as a surrogate. So that's just taking the wave vector k, um, the, the Debye wave vector k sub d, multiplying by the average velocity, and, um, and then calculating the, the Debye cutoff frequency, which because there, it's a linear relationship, it's really just mapping it back onto the, onto the uh, frequency axis. Um, and the most commonly used limit is the Debye temperature, which is just the Debye frequency multiplied by reduced Planck's constant divided by KBT. So that's what you'll see tabulated most of the time. And I've expressed all of the different uh, substitutions here so that you can calculate a Debye temperature by knowing the average group velocity that you've used in your approximation, in your Debye approximation, and essentially the number density of unit cells or atoms um, in, in the substance. So as you might expect, the Debye temperature is going to increase with, as, the, as the material becomes more stiff, so it has a higher group velocity and it will decrease with atomic mass. And so I've just included a table here um, of different Debye temperatures. Uh, the Debye temperature of diamond, which is a very hard, stiff, um, three-dimensional lattice, is very, very high. Uh, but more commonly, uh, more common materials have somewhat lower Debye temperatures. Silicon is shown here. That's also a very hard material, so we might expect it to be uh, a fairly high Debye temperature. Sodium is a light atom, but it's also weakly bonded in the solid state, and so it has a very low Debye temperature. And then copper and molybdenum are, are somewhere in the middle, around room temperature. Knowing the Debye temperature is quite important because often we'll, we'll want to express the results of a property calculation uh, as a limit of either low temperature relative to the Debye temperature or high temperature relative to the Debye temperature. We go through that here. This is a very um, busy slide, I suppose, with lots and lots of equations. Um, and, and really, I won't go through them you know, completely step by step. It's something that, that uh, you can do on your own. But um, as we go through these integrals, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that are, I think, quite important to understand. What we've done here is, first of all, we've made in the first in the first main equality here, we are making the Debye approximation, right? So that's where the substitution is happening. Uh, we still have to evaluate this temperature derivative of the distribution function. And this we'll, we'll do this calculation for three dimensions, um, but in order to calculate the specific heat. We move down to the next line, and what we've done as I said at the end of last lecture, is that we've taken that three-dimensional case space and turned it into a into a spherical system. And so that implies that we're averaging over the over the case space, that there's some symmetry within the case space. So that, again, this velocity averaging, there's a lot that goes into that that we don't have time to go through. And in fact, it, it, the, the usage varies quite a bit. So you just have to be very careful with, with how you, you deal with the Debye approximation and know what approximations are being made. Now, uh, we also often can benefit from converting that. Even the case space integral in a spherical system uh, we will we can benefit from converting it to frequency domain, and the way to do that is to include the uh, the Debye density of states in frequency space. You'll notice that in both cases, what we're doing is we're we have an upper limit on our integrals of the Debye factor in frequency. It's the Debye frequency over what I'm circling now is the Debye wave vector. And so that's, uh, that's a very important factor to, to know or to recognize is there. And again, because this is three-dimensional, um, what we have, I've done all the substitutions in this last line. 
this last line down here, all the substitutions have been made um, except for the explicit representation for the temperature der derivative of the distribution function, which we do in the last step. We also, because we have a three-dimensional problem, and we're going to take, again, just the acoustic branches, the three acoustic branches. We have one that's longitudinal and two that are transverse. Um, we put those in here and we evaluate. And again, we can express this specific heat in terms of the unit cell density, that's eta sub a, and then a bunch of other constants. This, this integral we'll, we're going to need to evaluate. We'll do that on the next slide. Um, and then the Debye temperature. And we find that we have a T, a temperature, to the power 3 dependent. So specific heat increases in a cubic way. Now, there's still a little bit more to do here. This integral has a, a temperature dependency to it as well. So we'll, we'll hold off on kind of making that a conclusion. And we'll, we'll talk about where it does apply in that T to the power 3 dependence. So for low temperatures, we can approximate that, or we can solve that integral, the integral on the, on the, in the last equation. And indeed, we find that for very low temperatures in the Debye approximation, we have a T cubed dependence. And everything else is a constant or a known. And that's a, that's a very important um, finding, because it really can tell you that uh, what dimensionality your, your um, your material is, right? Because I, this is for a three-dimensional material. In a couple of lectures from now, we'll go through lower dimensional materials, but that T cube dependence is a signature of specific heat for, for bulk materials. Then for higher temperatures, we have to evaluate the integral a little bit differently. What we find, and this is maybe a bit of a surprise, is that the temperature dependence of the integral offsets the temperature dependence in the T cubed factor that was the pre-multiplier. And we find that we have a, uh, instead of a, any temperature dependence, we just have a constant, that the specific heat asymptotes for very high temperatures far above the Debye temperature, it asymptotes to a constant. And that constant's very simple. It's three, that comes from the dimensionality, multiplied by the uh, the density of unit cells and Boltzmann's constant. And this is also a very important uh, finding in physics and it's also something that's pretty easy to measure. Uh, it's called the law of Dulong and Petit. We'll actually see it again because we can we can actually reach that point through some other routes that we'll talk about in the next lecture. That's it for today. Thank you.